Because God is on the move. If you would turn with me to Colossians 2, 6. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Paul says in his word, do not find it tedious to remind. So this is a scripture probably a lot of us have heard before. This is a truth that we have heard time and time and time again. But you know what? Sometimes in the midst of the battle, in the heat of the battle, in the midst of the circumstance and whatever we're facing, sometimes the truth slips from our hearts and our minds. And I feel like the Lord wants me to encourage you in the truth this morning. The title of my message is Walk in Him. Walk in Him. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in Him. Rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, as you have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. The Apostle Paul wrote this book to the church in Colossae, and he this is one of his prison epistles. So he wrote Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, all within prison walls. So I take that as something that was impressed upon the Apostle's heart while he was in jail. This is one of the books that he penned to the church in Colossae. So I would think, and I think that you would think, that these were important words, right? If you were facing a Roman prison and you were in jail, okay, some of us have been in jail, right? Brennan, me and you've been there for sure. If we were there and I was to write a letter, the words that I would write down in that letter would be something that was impressed upon my heart to tell the recipient, whoever I was writing, this is important, I'm writing this from jail, right? So Paul was in, in the Roman prison and he wrote to the Colossians about maturing in Christ. He found that that, that was that important to let them know, look, I know that you are saints of God. I know that you are faithful, brethren. I know that you are true. But there is some, there are things, there are lies that are going to come against you. And I want to encourage you in the truth and the ways of God so that we would mature as believers in the things of God. See, we, we get born again at the moment of salvation, the moment that we give our hearts to the Lord. But then we got to learn how to walk. Just like a baby. You're born, but then we got to learn how to crawl. We got to learn how to sit up. We got to learn how to roll over. We got to learn how to eat. We got to learn how to walk. And that's what the Lord impressed upon my heart this morning. The same way as you have received Christ, which is through faith. By grace, which you are saved, not of works, unless we would boast, right? The same way you have received him is the same way we walk in him. So the Lord spoke to my heart. And what I've come to propose to you this morning is that as believers, we are to mature and we are to grow. And we're going to talk about how we mature and grow and the evidence. Of maturity and growth how we mature and grow and the evidence of maturity and growth so in the beginning of the book of Colossians Colossians 1 verse 2 you can put it on the board if you want to Colossians 1 verse 2 in the beginning of the verse he says to the Saints and the faithful brethren in Christ where are at Colossae Saints you are Saints we are saints of God. That word saints means sacred, pure, blameless, and set apart. Sacred, pure, blameless, and set apart. You can say, Angela, well, you have no idea what I said this morning. You have no idea what I did last night. You have no idea the feeble thoughts that have come to my mind. You have no idea what I have encountered in the last month. Well, my Bible says, but because the blood of Jesus Christ, you are pure, you are blameless, you are set apart for such a time as this. You are a saint of God. See, and the enemy would come in to tell us no, and he would remind 
remind us over and over again about our poor attitudes, about what we did at work, about how we lied, about how we cheated, about how we did this or that. And he would come to confuse you, to get you to believe the lie. But I believe this morning that the Lord has sent me to dispose of the lie and to remind you of the truth this morning. That you are pure, that you are spotless, that you are blameless before God, not because of yourself, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He wrote them and he said, you are faithful, brethren. Faithful means you are trustworthy. You are trustworthy with what? Didn't you see me mess up? Trustworthy with the truth. The truth that God has disposed, deposited into your heart, that we are faithful to tend to it. That we are faithful to protect it. We are faithful to defend it. And if you see someone else slipping off the path, why don't you defend them with the truth of God? Let's go encourage one another in the Lord. And Paul, he writes in Colossians 1, 3, and 4, he says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. I love this. I love this because Paul was a praying man. He didn't just come all high and mighty and think that he, everyone kind of bowed down to him. He's such a man of God. No, he said, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you, Colossae. Actually, the scripture says that they never even seen his face. He was never even able to make it to the Colossian church. But he said, I'm writing to you because I've heard of your faithfulness. And I've heard of your faith. And I've heard of you. And I am praying for you always. Let me tell you something. Prayer changes things. And prayer changes us. So if we have a circumstance or a situation or a family situation or a work situation or whatever the case may be, begin to pray for those people or that situation and God will begin to change you and the way that we look at it. And Paul says, I, I always mention you in our prayers. One thing I love about Pastor Matt, he's not in here right now, but Every single time, maybe I'm a little bit late to the prayer meeting, I walk in and he's just weeping before the Lord. Like he's being touched by God praying for us in this church. And I am grateful for a praying pastor. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for a worship team when I walk in at 8.30 in the morning that they're singing praises to God. I am grateful for Sabrina leading a women's meeting. I am grateful for Vince who shows up and I see his face. I am grateful to see you this morning in the household of God. There is something about the saints when they come together, the power of God that can move in this place. When we are seeking one thing which I have desired, one thing which I have sought after, that I would behold your beauty in the temple, not just this temple, but this temple. I want to see God formed in us. I want to see God formed in you. And that was the heart of Paul. He said, I'm praying for you always. Verse 4 says, since we have heard of your faith, that word heard means I, it's caught my attention. That's caught my attention. And the love of which you have to all the saints. So we're going to look at that real quick because he says, your faith has caught my attention, but it was expressed through love. The church of Colossae was a loving church. And I, and I wrote here as an example that people surrounding me and I were praying on the way to church this morning. And I looked at the buildings on the street that we passed. And I said, God, you have planted this church in this area. These people in these houses, I pray they hear of our faith and our love and that they are drawn to the presence of God and that they come in these doors not so we can say we have a church of a hundred, but so the power of God can be demonstrated in our lives and in their lives and it would trickle over. Amen. That we would see God. God has given us this land. This is our land. And he said, wherever the sole of your foot treads shall 
that they would hear of our faith and they would give audience to it. Why? Because it's expressed through our love for them and others. Amen. That's what a mature Christian looks like. Not just like when I first got saved, I'll tell this story and I'll tell on myself. I went home for Christmas and I was telling my brother all about the Bible. And I was hammering them. You want to talk about Bible bashing? I was <laughs> hammering my brother hard. And he was not hearing it. He just did not. He didn't want to hear it. And I love him to death. He didn't want to hear it though. And the Lord told me, he, the Lord said this, Angela, shut your mouth. <laughs> I heard him clear. Angela, shut your mouth and love him yeah. into the kingdom. So many times we can bash people with the truth. But behind, that spirit behind us trying to prove that we're right is wrong. Amen. So my expression of love and walking in Christ and my brother seeing the demonstration of the spirit expressed in my life every day. Two years later, he texted me and said, Angela, I just want to tell you I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry for losing touch with you. I'm really sorry for, for some things. I'm just really sorry. And the Lord reminded me of the moment he said, Angela, shut your mouth and love them into the kingdom. And that's sometimes what we have to do. God wants to demonstrate his love through us for people that's it that was an imprint of the colossian church when people walked in the doors they experienced the love of god and i don't mean this to beat us up but could we check our hearts what does it look like when people walk in the doors of our church is the imprint upon our church the love of god all right forget the church what about when they walk up to you personally at Walmart, when they cut you in line, or the checker ain't moving quick enough, or they, or we got cut off in traffic, or the person on the end of the telephone line that is trying to work with you on your phone isn't being so nice. <laughs> There's so many things and opportunities that the love of God can be expressed in our lives, and sometimes, hey, we blow it. And you know what? We don't beat ourselves up about it. But one thing that I seen in this scripture was, I want to be a part of the church. That the imprint upon my life is the love of God. Because look, the Bible says, you follow me, Shari? I know, girl, I move, I move. Okay, <laughs> because the Bible says this. In 1 Corinthians, I'm going to read it, so I'm going to read it real quick, okay? So I don't keep you too long. But in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, what does it say? And we're going to go through it to eight. What does it say that love is? Ready? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. What's that mean? That you, it, the sounding brass is loud, hollow, empty noise. Whoo, that hit me hard. Come on, y'all. Let's not act like we're we got angel wings, okay? We can come in here and speak in tongues, right? It also says, I have the gift of prophecy. We've heard the demonstration of the spirit of prophecy within our house, right? I can understand all mysteries. Pastor Matt can come up here and break some things down like nobody else's business, right? I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains and have not love. I am nothing. This, when I started reading this, because I was thinking about the Colossae Church, and I was like, okay, that, that love was an imprint. And then I started reading this, and I was like, okay, and now I bestow all my goods. Come on, you might have sold something for the Lord. <laughs> okay, you left something for the Lord. No, there's people that will sell everything for the kingdom of God, but they will be the meanest people on earth. I be, but I bestowed my goods. I, I gave to the Lord. But then you slam the door walking out in somebody's face on the way out the church house. 
because somebody didn't do something the way that we felt they should do. Okay. I feed the poor. I went out on the weekend, I fed the poor. So now, and I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. That means it is not a benefit and it's not useful. Not useful to the kingdom of God. He says, love suffers long. Oh, now we're talking. Are we long suffering with one another? Do we endure with patience with one another? Do we hold our tongue? Are we quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath? I tell you, I blow that one a lot. If Naya was in here, she would tell you. Maybe my mom could too. And is kind. Kind means you so show yourself useful and, and it's an action word. Kindness just isn't just like smiling at someone. Kindness is an action word. You sow yourself a benefit to someone else. Are we kind? Love, I'm sorry, love and the if not. It's not jealous. It's not jealous. It does not vaunt itself. That means that it is not puffed up. It's not inflated. We get the big head sometimes when we become Christians and we think, oh, we got it all together now. But quickly we find out we don't have it all together. It is not puffed up. It doesn't parade itself around. Does not behave itself unseemingly. That means our actions are appropriate and line up with the word of God. Are we acting unseemingly? We seek not our own, so we're not selfish. It is not provoked, so we're not stirred up easily. That one I blow a lot too. Start up real quick. Think if no evil. Rejoice not iniquity, but rejoice in truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But where there is prophecy, it shall fail. Where there is tongues, they shall cease. Where there is knowledge, it shall vanish away. One thing that they will remember that our imprint should be as a church is that she was patient with me. She was kind. Me. She believed for good things for me. She stood with me. She didn't act all better than me, but she came and lifted me up out of the mud when I was broken. That's what a church of maturity should look like. Love never fails. Hallelujah. And that's what Paul heard about this church, that they had a spirit of love. And the Bible says this. You should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy soul, and all thy strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself. So here we are. It's going to be Pastor Matt. <laughs> and as we place faith in Christ, now the Holy Ghost can work grace can come and flow through us and as we love God we can love others we cannot love others without loving God first as we place our faith in Christ, now grace, the power of God, can be reflected in our hearts. And we can love God, and he teaches us to love others. And not just teaches us, but he is the one that produces love for others. Because we'll find ourselves loving people that we hated. I don't hate. Yes, we do. If you did, if you say you don't, you probably never. You're a liar. Because we have hated, we have despised, we have rejected, we have been wounded, and because of our wounds, it produces a bitterness and a resentment, and that must be given and surrendered in faith to the Lord, so that the grace of God can now produce fruit within our lives. Amen. And one of the fruit is love. 
love. God, let us not be sounding brass, a hollow, empty sound when people walk in these doors. That they would sense the presence and the love for God. So Paul, in the beginning of chapter 2, as, as it has a conflict in his heart. And it says this, Colossians 2, 1. For I would have that you knew what great conflict I have for you. And for them at Laodicea, and for many as have seen my face in the flesh. He had deep concern. He was really troubled. Have you ever gone to anybody before and said, I'm really concerned for you. I'm really concerned. And that, that was his heartbeat. And I was like, okay, well, why was Paul concerned? He was just saying they were faithful, just saying they were saints, just saying that their imprint upon their church was love and it was expressed through love. What does Paul really have to be concerned with? Paul was troubled, as you'll see it in Colossians 2 8. He said, beware, beware, meaning being cautious. Be weary, be watchful, because lest any man spoil you. That word spoil means to strip, to rob, to carry away, to take away something that belongs to you. So he's saying, look, I know that you are saints of God. I know that you operate in love and you operate in truth. But I want you to beware. Get ready. Be on guard because there are those that are coming to ruin, to spoil, and to rob, which has been implanted in your heart. Your faith that you have in Christ, there are rudiments and things of this world that want to steal from us as the body of Christ. Because if it can take the truth, then we can have faith and grace. Faith and grace. Faith and grace. And a demonstrated demonstration of the spirit in our hearts cannot be produced because it's being taken away through what? Now let's see. It says, through philosophies and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, not after Christ. So the tools that the enemy will use, one, philosophy. The way that man thinks, man's great ideas, man's agenda, man's plan. The things of this world, vain deceit is empty delusion. And I started thinking about when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness in Luke 4, 6. The devil said to him, all this power will I give to you and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomever I will give it. If thou therefore will worship me, you shall be mine. And Jesus said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall I serve. See, vain deceit, empty delusion offers power, offers money, offers riches, offers things of this world that is a delusion to the eye. There's nothing wrong with being blessed by God. So I'm not saying that we cannot be blessed by God. But when we place our faith in the things of this world, they will vanish and fade away. And it is a delusion. Even force, power, money, greed. The things of this world will fade away. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. For I shall worship the Lord thy God and him only alone. The traditions of men. These are the tools that the enemy will use to rob our faith. What does the traditions of men look like? It looks like laws and rules and religion that man make up to keep us bound. There's only one changing factor that can change us, and that's the Holy Spirit through faith in Christ. That's it, and that's all. It's that simple. There's not a law that we can keep. If you read 30, 60 chapters a day, God bless you. But that's not going to be the changing factor. You can pray 20 hours a day. And that's great and that's wonderful. But that's not going to be the changing factor. You can go out on the street and tell everybody about Jesus. There is those that said, we cast out demons in your name. And he said, but I never knew you. That's a scary place to be. Because God's going to operate 
anyway. <laughs> He's going to deliver anyway. But he wants us to know him, and we don't know him by keeping the traditions of men. We don't know him by keeping rules and regulations. We know him through faith and experiencing his power expressed in our heart and in our lives. The rudiments of this world, force greed, selfishness, ambition, and pleasure. Can, can we all testify that we were driven by pleasure? Before Christ, we were driven by selfish ambition and however we could get to the top, whatever worked for us, whatever was in our favor. Well, he's saying, look, selfishness is not of the kingdom of God. This will rob the truth from you. He's saying ambition is not, look, I'm going to be honest with you. If I was an ambitious woman, I'd probably be a, a businesswoman somewhere. Building Angela's kingdom. Because God has given me the mind and the heart for business and to build. But God said, no, 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 I'm going to use that. I want you to build my kingdom. I want you to build my people. I want you to build my temple. I'm going to use what you're good at and the gifts and the abilities that I have given you. And I'm going to, I'm going to put them into the kingdom of God. I'm going to use your gift of music and a musician. To get you to glorify my name. See, if we were ambitious, you probably want to be a rock star somewhere, right? <laughs> right, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So God wants to use the things that we are good at and that he's given us to glorify him and not to glorify ourselves. And he will bless us in return. What we believe will manifest in our actions. Let me say that again. What we believe will manifest in our actions. So if you believe that reading the Bible, look, read your Bible, okay? But reading the Bible 30 hours, they're not even 30 hours. <laughs> if reading the Bible 10 hours a day and praying six hours a day and praying on your knees until they hurt, is going to add something to you for the kingdom of God. It's going to produce a self-righteousness in you. Because then I'm going to come into the church and say, Brennan, how much you read today? How much did you pray today? Oh, you didn't reach where I'm at? Well, and now I'm puffed up and I'm arrogant because I think I accomplished something. Oh, you didn't go to Bible college, Pam? Oh, well, that's just too bad. <laughs> That's how we get. We get puffed up and arrogant and we think that we're some. Did you hear Naya hit that key off today? She was thinking that we can do it better. <laughs> I don't know if she hit anything off at all. I don't have an ear for that kind of stuff. But I'm just saying that's how we become when we believe that what we do adds us some merit with God when what we do doesn't, it doesn't merit anything with God. It's what we believe that produces grace, that produces the character of God, that produces their faithfulness. So Paul was saying, look, the same way you received your salvation when you knew nothing about the Lord. When I got saved, I was in a jail cell in an orange jumpsuit with chains around my body. I did not know who Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were. I did not know anything about God. And when I got saved, I, I heard the gospel. I heard the good news. I heard that I was a sinner and I was in need of a savior. And you know what I did? I said, yes. That's all that I needed to know at that moment. And that's still, as simple as it sounds, all that we need to know still. Amen. And God says, yes, become skillful in the word of God. Study the word of God just to show thyself if proved. This is truth. But the only way to walk after the Lord is to walk by faith in what he has done. And I'm going to explain what that means. Paul's desire was to see the church grow. So we see three, three things first. We see Colossae had received the Lord. They were set apart, so they were saints of God. They were faithful and trustworthy. And 
that they expressed their love for God through their love for people. God let us be that way. But then we see Paul was in conflict because the Colossians were being troubled on every side. Those that were coming to spoil them. Those that were coming to beguile them, meaning to deceive them and mislead them. I'll tell you this, when I first got saved, I received Christ through faith and grace. But then I started to try to work. Every Christian mostly does. Because then you got to try to be good. I'm a Christian now. Now i got to be good. Ooh, I, I, I'm not going to say a cuss word. I'm not going to go to those places no more. I'm not going to do this no more. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to, and all of a sudden you find yourself doing that stuff. Amen. Paul said it himself. He said, there's a war within my members. And that's what the war is. The war is a fight of faith. He said, I do what I don't want to do. And that's what happens when we try to work it out. Work it out, work it out, work it out. And Paul said, look, I'm coming to tell you that there's others going to try to mislead you, but I want you to stay the course in the truth. There's a truth that is going to demonstrate, and my spirit is going to demonstrate within your life because of what you believe to be the truth. So he says this, as you therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. As you, an individual, I can't bring my mom to heaven. I can't bring my dad to heaven. I can't bring Naya to heaven. I can't bring Brennan to heaven. I can't bring Pam to heaven. I can't bring you with me. Because it says, as you, as you, therefore, it's an individual decision. Are we going to decide today that we want to receive Christ Jesus? That means take him for yourself. He is
There are things that, look, even our own mind can doubt. Even our own hearts can waver. We have ungodly bents that are still in us that still need to be changed. You don't need to know what mine are, and I don't need to know what yours are. But God still is in the changing business. And you are in Christ. So the power, if I were to unplug, unplug all of these monitors, no power would be running through them. The cross of Calvary has unplugged the power of sin over your life. You are free from everything that would try to entrap and discourage and dismantle your life. You are free. Amen. But it's something that we need to believe. Remember I told you what you believe is expressed through your life. So when we believe the truth, the Holy Ghost now has the free reign to produce a manifestation of his
that grace may abound, which means increase. You know, Naya used to tell me this story, and I'm just going to put her on blast for a second. She used to say she just used, used God's grace, his goodness, his forgiveness as a blanket. Like, I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to ask for forgiveness. I'm going to go do that, and I'm going to ask for forgiveness. It was just like a blanket of grace. And don't act like we haven't done that before. You know you were going to do that bad thing, and you were like, well, God will forgive me after. <laughs> right? How many times have we done that? Right, right. How many times have we been boiling over inside, and we know the words that are about to come out of our mouth are not, they're going to be unseemingly, let's just say it that way. But we open our mouths anyway. And we got to go back and apologize. Not always. Um, she's like, Angela, would you just be quiet? You know you're going to have to go back and apologize. Good friends, right? Good friends. <laughs> but we, God doesn't want us to use his grace just to cover. Now, God's grace will cover. Right. It will. But God said, the, the word of God says, shall we remain in sin that his grace may increase? Let's see what the word of God says. Romans 6, 2. God forbid. That means away with the thought. Get that mindset out of your heart and your mind. Right, right. That God's grace is just going to continuously cover the sin we have deliberately chosen to walk in. Because we're going to find ourselves in a hole somewhere and not being able to get out. He said, don't let that thought be in your mindset. God forbid. So then the question is asked, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? What does that mean? Dead to sin. Look, dead man don't walk. Dead man don't talk. Dead man don't even think. Dead man don't speak. Mm -hmm. Help us, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> See, that word dead to sin means the relationship you once had with sin is now dead. Hallelujah. It is no more. The Bible says in Romans 6, 11, likewise, reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Reckon means take inventory, and the conclusion is it's dead. Listen, likewise, reckon yourself. Take inventory. See all of that ugliness. It's okay. The Bible says to examine one's heart to see if we be in the faith. So take some inventory of where we're at in, walk, in our walk with God, and then you have the right through the blood and the legal right to reckon yourself, to conclude that is dead. I have no more relationship with that thing, and it no longer has power over me. Listen, I know that this is kind of an old truth that we've been preaching for a long time, but it is a good truth. Because that war that Pastor Matt was talking about is never going to cease or stop. And those tools that the enemy is using is always going to be used to ruin and spoil us. So he says, reckon yourself dead. Take inventory. And then Romans 6, 3 says, Know you not that so many of us that were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? That, mean, that word, know you not, means don't you know? Remind yourselves. Don't you know that you were baptized into Christ? That you are fully immersed in him? You are now in him? But not only in Christ, but you are dead to sin. Baptized into his death. That means when he died as your substitute, you died to your old life, to your old way of thinking, to your old way of doing things. It 
I don't want beer. I want a good thing. But I was thinking about this. When you were placed in Christ, you got a new ID. Once an old man, you are now a new man. You have a new identity Hallelujah. in Christ, right? Praise God. So we are now not under the law, but if you're speeding hmm. and a cop comes up behind you, you were wrong, right? <laughs> we're wrong. The law, okay, we were lying, and the Holy Ghost comes and convicts you of lying. That law is to tutor you, to bring you to grace. Not to keep you under condemnation and say, you're wrong, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. Because what Christ did at the cross says, I am not guilty. So when, so, so yes, I acknowledge I am wrong. I have broken the law, but yet now I can look to Christ, which covers and which brings forth grace that produces his character in my life. So no longer am I a liar anymore, but I am a truth teller. Oh, and I remember when I first got, listen, I'm going to put myself out there for real. When I first got saved, you ever meet those people that lie so much they believe your, you, you believe your own lies? <laughs> I used to lie so much. Literally. Right, Mom? <laughs> My mom will tell you. I would get you to believe that the sky was red. And I wouldn't leave you until you believed that the sky was red. And literally, I used to lie so much that I actually believed my own lies. But the Holy Ghost, he know how to get in those deep, deep cracks in your heart. And there were seasons in the beginning of my walk that I would be telling Naya like a story from like whenever. Totally fabricated story. But like I believed it. Like, I believe it actually happened. And like, you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. But I, and you can be like, how could you actually, because you tell lies for so long, you actually believe they actually happened. Right. And, and especially living in the lifestyle it was. So the Holy Ghost would begin to be like, you know, that's not true, right? <laughs> but it wasn't to keep me there to tell me how horrible I was or how bad I was. It was to reveal, Angela, this character flaw in you, this got to change. This has to change. Can we work on this thing right here? You know those little white lies we like to tell too? Or that little fabricated, you know, you're like, you um, you make it bigger than it is, right? We like to exaggerate things. All those different things God began to hit on. Oh, that, and I would go back to him, and it was so humiliating. I would go back to Naya and be like, I gotta tell you. And she actually started getting used to it. Because that's how much I would lie. And I would go back and I would tell you, you know, uh, that thing I told you about that happened to me when I was like 18, yeah, it didn't really happen that way. Or it didn't happen at all. <laughs> and she's like, what? And I'm like, I don't know, it's weird. Like the Lord is showing me that these things are not true. And, and, and then later on, as we became better friends, I'd be like, Naya, she'd be like, tell me it's a lie. And, and it would be. And, and eventually, I got all the lying out. And it was over. <laughs> Praise, Praise God. God. But no, pray, when God will do that little by little by little by little, he will show us our own deceptiveness. He will show us, okay, cheating on your taxes. You put too much mileage on the what is supposed to look like anything, okay? Speeded, and that was wrong. 
But I know that they're not going to find nothing. I know that they're not going to find anything. And we can have a confidence yeah. in our new identity yeah. in Christ yeah. that even when we're wrong, we can hand him the new identity and say, no, I am covered by the blood of Jesus. I might have been wrong, but no citation needed. I am free. I am free. I am free. I am free. And that's maturity in Christ. That's when we begin to mature in Christ. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore, we are buried with him unto baptism of the dead. So that means that you are not only dead in him, but you are buried with him. That means all your sins, past, present, and future, are buried. They are buried. No longer to be dug up. Listen, Shelby, don't go digging up my dead bones, okay? And I won't dig up yours. <laughs> we don't need to dig up our own dead bones right, right. and be like remember what I did remember what I no leave them there they are buried in Christ and we don't need to dig up each other's backyards Amen. leave it be it is buried it is dead it is in him your transgressions are forgiven you are free but remember, God forbid that we would believe that we could sin and grace would just cover. Sin, grace is not used as a license to sin, but it is used as a power to live free. See, that's where we get it wrong sometimes. I just need to keep repenting. Yeah, repentance is needful in the life of a believer. But let's not live in willful disobedience just thinking that God is going to keep on covering. No, he won't allow us to become captive to that thing until we get on our faces and really seek yeah. after wanting to change. Yeah. Amen. But we don't have to go there. Because his grace is there to empower us to live free. Amen. Because then it says in the same verse, Romans 6, 4, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we shall walk. Remember, walk in him. Walk in newness of life. Walk in newness of life. So this is going to be my last example. Naya, if you would please come up. Walk in newness of life. Remember, the same way that I guess your face is going to heaven. The same way as we have received Christ Jesus, so order our lives after him. What is the truth? We are dead in Christ. To order our lives means to order it like trample and tread a path. There is a path. We are dead in Christ. We are buried with him. We are raised in newness of life with him. There is freedom as we place our faith and trust in these truths. Sin shall no longer have dominion over me. I am free. I am forgiven. I am raised. There is a new power source. There is freedom that comes when we place our faith in that. There is victory. Victory. There is peace. Anybody need peace in the house? There is joy, joy in the midst of our trial. Why? Because I am dead in Christ and hopelessness shall no longer have power over me. Amen. Love. There is love when I feel lonely and I can no longer move forward. There is healing all coming from Calvary, all coming from placing our faith in Christ and who he is. There is healing. There is blessings. He is a blessing God, y'all. Sometimes I have looked at people and the things of this world and I have said, why do they prosper? Why do the wicked prosper? And I'm sitting here serving you to the best of my abilities and the Lord would just say, just wait, Angela. I have blessings in store for you. I have good things in store for you. So there's blessings in Christ. There's provision in Christ. Whatever you have need of. And there's life in Christ. There's a better life than you could ever experience or ever came up with.
with. Amen. There is life in Christ. So the Lord says this, look, I want you to tread this path. This is your path. Every single day of your life, this path, I can mark it. This path, the Holy Spirit can live in. When I keep my eyes fixed on Him, but if I step out of the path, I can't receive what He has for me because the Holy Ghost only works within the framework of faith in Christ and the path. So out here, this morning. 